Ladies and gentlemen, we will go ahead and commence uh, with this panel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, panel on uh, reforming the EPA. I think we'll have an excellent discussion and uh, we've got some excellent uh, folks that uh, will testify to a number of points. And, and with that, I'm going to start uh, with uh, Myron Ebel, who uh, many of you do know because he is so effective with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He, in particular, chairs the Cooler Heads Coalition, uh, which, uh, was an, which is an ad hoc coalition over two dozen nonprofit groups, including the Heartland Institute. And, uh, and he also led uh, Trump's transition agency action team for the EPA, which, as I understand, led to public protests and marches in several cities across the United States. And, uh, and, and to top it all off, the Sierra Club uh, president wrote that Myron Ebel is, quote, one of the single greatest threats our planet has ever faced. And with that, very good, very good. And that is a very good sign. And Myron, I hope, was going to talk about our current attempts uh, and progress on currently reforming the EPA. So Myron, welcome to uh, the uh, panel, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I want to thank the Heartland Institute for holding another outstanding conference, and I want to, I'm honored to be with you and my colleagues here. Uh, in 1981, Ronald Reagan nominated Ann Gorsuch to be EPA administrator. Uh, the EPA was 11 years old, and Reagan already felt that the EPA was out of control. And he told Ann Gorsuch that his, her job was to uh, reduce the regulatory reach of the EPA and to slim down the agency. Uh, she was run out of town in 1983 and had to go back to Colorado uh, after being censured by the Democratic-controlled House of Representatives. Uh, the, the subsequent EPA administrators learned the lesson of Ann Gorsuch and they never took on the EPA bureaucracy. And a very high uh, appointed official in the Clinton EPA, who worked directly for Carol Browner, told me quite, I, I couldn't stop laughing, uh, told me during Scott Pruitt's time of troubles this spring that, oh, we learned right away, never take on the EPA bureaucracy. This is the Clinton, this is Carol Browner. Don't take on the EPA bureaucracy. So I guess it isn't a surprise that the second administrator in the history of the agency who tried to take on the EPA bureaucracy uh, resigned after uh, a year and a little less than a half in office. Uh, during that time, Scott Pruitt uh, achieved a lot. Uh, he was a tremendous promoter and advocate for the Trump deregulatory agenda. And uh, I just want to digress a little there and say that for President Trump, the deregulatory agenda is key to his plans for the economic revival of this country. Because the coasts, despite their totally failed and catastrophic state governments, uh, the coasts have done pretty well in this era of, of 15 to 20 years of economic stagnation. Silicon Valley has done well because it's not regulated. The financial, market, uh, financial industry in New York has done well because they get handouts from Washington. And we can go down the list, but the resource and manufacturing base in this country has stagnated or gone downhill. Rural America has gone downhill. And President Trump got that in the campaign, and the reason he was elected, in my view, is because he, he had a response to that, which is we are going to get the regulatory onslaught that the Obama administration has perpetrated on Heartland America. We're going to get it off the backs of those people so that they can get back to work, back to investing, and back to, to growing their economy. So Scott Pruitt was part of that. Uh, I think uh, where, you know, this, the title of this uh, talk is the title of my slideshow last year, so I, I, I may just be repeating myself. But I think uh, Scott Pruitt 
uh, was a very great, a very excellent public advocate for this agenda. In terms of taking on the agency, I think his record is much more mixed. I think uh, we are, we are already seeing that some of the, uh, the major rules that need to be repealed and possibly replaced, uh, that they're behind schedule. Of course, this is the life, this is the, the story of bureaucracy. You're always running behind. You get further and further behind because there's opposition and there's obstruction. But I think uh, some of the major rules, they're going to have a really hard time getting them done and litigated before the end of the first Trump term. So, uh, and I would particularly point out to the waters of the U.S. rule, uh, and uh, I think there are problems with the so-called clean power plan, repeal and replace, the NSPS, the new source performance standards for new, new power plants is way behind. Uh, so, in terms of actually taking on the agency, I think uh, Scott Pruitt, like many people, uh, came up against a brick wall and uh, didn't, didn't knock the wall down, but instead got a very large knot on his head. Uh, I would also say that the Republican Congress is a huge problem. Uh, President Trump his first budget request from Mick Mulvaney at OMB, and by the way, he's the superstar of this administration, he proposed a 31% budget cut for EPA. Now, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna shrink the regulatory footprint of EPA, how are you gonna do it if you, if you don't get rid of a lot of regulators? So a key part of the Trump agenda was outside of, of the administration's control. It was the appropriations process. Trump said, uh, uh, and Mick Mulvaney said, we want 31% less money in the first year at EPA. So that's a, that's a tremendous start. Congress, the Republican-controlled Congress, gave him 7% cut. So I think I would say, you know, if, if you want to fix what's wrong at EPA, they have to have less money. Uh, and I, in my view, they have to have a lot less money, and I think 31 percent is a good start, but 7 percent is a pathetic start. So, uh, you know, I think I, I, there are some frustrations with what's, what's happening at EPA, and we now have a change of leadership, and Andrew Wheeler, and we can talk more about, uh, I've known Andrew for a long, long time. He's worked for two great Americans uh, already. Uh, Jim Inhofe for uh, the Senate EPW Committee and Bob Murray as a lobbyist for Murray Energy. Uh, so he's got, a great tr he's got a great pedigree. He's worked for two great Americans. Uh, we can say more about him uh, later and what, what he might do. Uh, and I'll, at that, I'll let Tim Hulskamp ask the, that wasn't even a question, Tim. You're, you're, <laughs> you just said, you know, start talking. Um, well, being from Washington, D.C., I figured you could <laughs> handle that question, Myron. Uh, but you wonder if he really is from Washington, D.C., when, when he did say he thought they had too much money. They had, uh, and that is a, that is a uh, very unusual statement to make out of Washington, D.C., but uh, Myron, I appreciate uh, your efforts on the transition, your efforts of pointing that out, and, and we'll spend some time uh, filling some questions about, about these issues. So, but next, we'll, we'll quickly go to Steve Malloy, and he's going to talk about what's next on science and endangerment. And uh, Steve is a recognized leader in the fight against junk science, which is a term that uh, he's been credited with uh, uh, with, and he's the founder and publisher of JunkScience.com, and from 2000 to 2009, he wrote the popular Junk Science column for Fox News. He's an expert on energy, environment, public health, and uh, plenty of other issues. His most latest book is Scare Pollution, and uh, Steve also served on the uh, EPA transition team, and so if you could, uh, Steve, give us uh, some thoughts on what's next on the science side, and particularly on the endangerment finding. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, so when I was on transition, uh, which Myron had invited me to join, uh, Myron tasked me with writing the science part of the plan. And uh, so, so I did, but I never really had high hopes for it being implemented just because, you know, science is not something that Republicans like to deal with, especially in the context of the environment. And, you know, al although, um, 
President Trump and uh, Scott Pruitt hit the ground running and you know, uh, President Trump ordered the Clean Power Plan to be repealed and they got us out of Paris. And that was all terrific, but I didn't think anything was gonna happen on science. And you know, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was not unexpected, but kind of sad. And then, but we got to the fall and all of a sudden Scott Pruitt announces his plan. He's gonna revamp the science advisory process at EPA. EPA has all these uh, science advisory panels are supposed to be uh, composed of independent scientists, and and they used to be 20 years ago. But over the last 20 years, um, they've been overtaken by EPA grantees, and so EPA would uh, tell basically you know give give university researchers money to do research for areas and areas that EPA wanted to regulate, and then they would invite these same researchers back on the panels to basically rubber stamp their own work and validate EPA's regulatory programs. And it got to be quite, quite a problem. For example, uh, EPA has a uh, clean air uh, advisory committee called KSAC. It has a, part, a panel on particulate uh, matter, and that panel has 26 members. 24 of them were EPA grantees who had received about $260 million worth of EPA research dollars. Of course, they're just gonna go along with what, e they're just gonna rubber stamp what EPA wants. And so last fall, all of a sudden, Scott Pruitt announced he was gonna fix that, that no longer were, were EPA grantees gonna be allowed to serve on these panels. They could either choose to be grantees or they could choose to be science advisors. And, and so uh, I thought that was a fantastic uh, regulatory reform and indeed Scott Pruitt implemented that. So you know, three cheers for him for that. And then we get to December and I was very happy with that. I thought that was huge progress. And we get to December and Scott Pruitt proposes the repeal of the Clean Power Plan, which are the Obama climate rules. And I'm going through there, and I see that what Scott Pruitt has done is adopt, a, if, you, if you read my book, Scare Pollution, which is all about particulate matter, you'll see that my, theory, my thesis is that particulate matter in the air doesn't kill anybody. Uh, the Obama EPA's thesis was that particulate matter is responsible for one out of five deaths in America every year. And so Scott Pruitt adopted the sort of a, a middle ground where you know below the regulatory standard, uh, particulate matter doesn't kill um, doesn't kill anyone, which completely changed the cost benefit calculation for the repeal of the clean power plant. So that was another great uh, move. And then move forward to the spring, um, Scott Pruitt announces this what I can only you know, describe as a you know a total overhaul of how EPA does science. It's called its science transparency rule. And, you know, originally, and this is something that was in the transition plan, originally it conceived of a way to combat this uh, problem of secret science at EPA. You know, over the last 25 years, there is uh, a couple lines of key studies that EPA has been relying on to regulate. The war on coal was entirely based on these uh, two lines of study, the Harvard Six City study, and American Cancer Society line of studies. Um, and you know, oddly enough, the researchers had secreted this data from public review. Uh, EPA's independent science advisors had asked for the data as early as 1994. EPA never responded, never made the researchers produce the data even though uh, it had been uh, paid for with taxpayer dollars, EPA dollars. Um, then Congress got in, in the act. Congress started asking EPA for the data, and EPA just affirmatively stonewalled, said, Congress, you don't need this data. Um, fast forward to 2011, when Republicans took control of Congress again. Uh, once again, they started asking EPA and the researchers for the data. EPA refused. Congress subpoenaed EPA. EPA ignored the subpoena. Uh, Congress started passing bills to get this data. EPA ignored them. The researchers ignored them. They kept getting their grants. Uh, so here comes Scott Pruitt, and Scott Pruitt now has uh, started a regulatory process that, you know, if, the, if, if key data is not available to the public for independent replication, it's just not going to be used in EPA rules. And this is going to be devastating to EPA's uh, over-regulatory air quality program. Now, what's really amazing is that this transparency rule that EPA is working on now, it goes way beyond secret science. You know, one of the first things I worked on uh, that had to do with EPA science was EPA's use of default assumptions and risk assessment, default assumptions like the linear, uh, linear you know, threshold model for carcinogenesis. And this is a model that, you know, if, 
It's used in, in uh, for example, radiation risk assessment. You know, we know that very high levels of radiation increase cancer risk, but we don't know what happens at much lower levels. So what EPA does is just draw a line from the data we have down to the origin of the graph, and the assumption then is that any exposure to radiation increases um, risk of cancer. And of course, uh, over the years we have come to learn that that whole assumption is based on scientific fraud. There's no data to back it up, yet EPA still relies on this in a, a lot of its chemical and radiation risk assessment. And so Scott Pruitt now has proposed that, um, you know, he has proposed to get, rid, to get rid of the LNT, but what he has proposed as part of his transparency rule is that all these default assumptions be explained, what we know, what we don't know, and that's really all I was ever interested in. You know, if, if EPA wants to regulate, you know, I understand that's a, inherently a political question. Of course, you know, at this point in my career, I realize EPA shouldn't be regulating as much as it does. But if EPA wants to regulate, fine. What it has to do is explain why. And there's no need to lie about why it wants to regulate, which has been happening way too often with the science. And so Scott Pruitt, I know that you know, he's not a very popular figure now, and he had to resign and all that, but uh, he did some great things at EPA. And I, in, in my view, regardless of how he left EPA, he, he was one of the greatest EPA administrators there's ever, well, he was the greatest EPA administrator there's so, ever so, been. So low, low bar. Low yeah. bar, yeah. low bar, <laughs> low bar. But he started all these really important things on you know, these science issues that nobody has ever cared about before. I mean, the Bush EPA did nothing on this Reagan EPA, nothing. I mean, it, it's really been shameful, and of course, you know, the Obama EPA they went the other direction, um, you know, as hard and fast as they could. So Scott Pruitt has tried to put the brakes on that. Now I hope that Andrew Wheeler, the acting EPA administrator, and whether it's Andrew Wheeler in the future or whoever the president nominates, um, you know, they've got this marker that Scott Pruitt has laid down to finish and implement. So I hope they do that. Your turn. Nicely done. Yes. And you got your book in there. Thank you, Steve. And uh, the third member of the transition team, were there any other members of the transition team? Just you three? No, there are a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch. Next up, uh, we'll hear from Amy Oliver Cook, uh, actually from the, the state of Colorado. Amy is the executive vice president uh, and the director of the Energy and Environmental Policy Center for the Independence Institute. Uh, a free market state-based think tank. She's worked in both policy and operations since 2004. Uh, there are many things good to say about her, and, and most recently the Heartland Institute has been active working with Amy on some efforts at the, the state level. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Amy for uh, 10 minutes or so to discuss what happens with real reform and what does it look like at the state level uh, pushing uh, back and, and doing the right thing on environmental issues. Well, um, first of all, thank you all for being here, and thanks to the Heartland Institute for putting this together, uh, putting together another fabulous conference. And James Taylor back there, uh, some people would call it or call him my co-conspirator in Colorado. I call him a fabulous ally that actually helped us flip an editorial board. So um, thank you, James, right? They did it physically. Yeah. Right, right. You know what, whatever we have to do, <laughs> when I need some muscle, you know who I call. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna read something to you real quick um, because it really gets to why I do what I do. Um, this is actually, believe it or not, from the Washington Post. Sharon Garcia is stumbling around her dining room in the dark trying to find post-it notes. As she has for years, Garcia wants to affix the notes marked with dollar signs to light switches all over her house. The message to her five kids, light is expensive. Why do you need to turn off the lights? She asks her son. Because otherwise there's no money, he answers. And when there's no money, you can't feed us or take us anywhere. Bingo, again. And it's not just light switches, though. Ever since her power was shut off in 2010, Garcia has adopted a Depression-era obsessiveness. She doesn't use the oven in the summer because it heats up the house. She only uses one small window air conditioner, 
Even the aquarium goes dark when someone's not in the room and forget about machine wash dishes. Garcia does them all by hand. Toaster and microwave have sticky notes, ordering the user to unplug them afterward lest they continue drawing energy from the sockets. You think turning it off is enough. And it's not, she admonishes. And yet, no matter how much she rations and cuts, she cannot keep ahead of the fast rise in rates. She runs a daycare out of her home. Her monthly electric bill is about $200 a month. And this is in Pueblo, Colorado. Her rent is only $8.50. Garcia's extreme frugality is in part the result of coal plants shutting down as Colorado transitions to renewable energy. To a wealthy community, skyrocketing electric rates might not have much of an impact. When you have a decent paying job, what's a few more dollars a month on your utility bill? But Pueblo's not that kind of place. The poverty rate of 18.1% incomes far below the state average, and a third of the population on some sort of state assistance. Those few dollars can make a big difference. And that's from the Washington Post, July 2014. And you know what? That was done to her by design. Now, who does that to somebody? Well, in part, state lawmakers in, the, in Colorado did. By the way, we do have one of our heroes here today, Kim Ransom from the state of Colorado. Thanks for being here, Kim. She's one of, she's one of the good guys, good gals in the state legislature. Um, if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. We have to do these things. We have to fuel switch. We have to shut down base load affordable hydrocarbons and, and, and move to intermittent expensive industrial wind because if we don't do it, the EPA and the feds are gonna make us. I can't tell you the number of, of hearings I went to, testimony I listened to, where that excuse was made every single time. If we don't do it, the feds are gonna make us. And you know what, I'd watch even, I'd watch fellow Republicans you know, come up to me afterward and say, listen, uh, the feds are gonna make us do this. You know what the greatest thing about 2016 is? I don't have to hear that argument again. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> the, Colorado, the Colorado legislature and our governor must own whatever it is they do to the people in the state of Colorado. And that's where it should be. It was funny. We were ha um, I won't divulge exactly what was said, but one of the conversations, and we, had, we, we, would, have, um, we would have lively discussions on transition team, and one of them was, you know, we, we talked a lot about much of the stuff should be going back to the states, right? I mean, this is the, these are states should be doing this. We we got involved, you know, in the clean power plan. Why? Because the federal government has no business essentially telling a state, micromanaging a state's power grid. Uh, but but those of us who are from well, I don't even say I'm from a blue state. I'm from a green state, which is so there's there's sort of blue dog Democrat, and then and then there's Colorado. We we we're we're closer to California than we are to uh, Michigan or Ohio or any places like that. In fact, we, you know, I I, I sort of fantasize about what it would be like to be in a state like that. Um, <laughs> but I'm held captive by by my. Um, by the California mentality that Colorado has managed to adopt. But we were having these conversations, and of course there were a couple of us from states, and, and we were like, God, the worst thing that could happen now would be all of this, all of this going back to the state of Colorado, because as we're advocating for federalism and saying, yeah, let the states do it, we're looking at you, oh my God, that'll mean my state will do it. Um, but, it but, 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 that is where the fight should be had. And um, it's people like Sharon Garcia is why we do this. Just, just so you, just these policies 
have, have a real world impact. We talk about, you know, at the federal level, and, and, and you talk about um, all the reforms that need to happen and st or have happened and still need to happen. But there are real people out there that have to pay the price. In Colorado, our electricity rates over the last 15 years have gone up 62%. We have, um, and James Taylor can tell you, that we have the second highest electricity rates in sort of this western state region, uh, Mount, what you'd call the Mountain West region. The only one that's higher than, that, than Colorado is Arizona. And, and listen, what happened to Sharon Garcia and what happened, um, what has happened in Colorado with fuel switching and renewable mandates is um, these are, this is not a, like, this is not a supply and demand problem. It's not as if we don't have enough electricity. And in fact, our monopoly utilities will tell you, oh yeah, we got plenty of capacity. We got tons of capacity. This is about building more and more intermittent, expensive energy on the backs of captive customers who have no choice but to pay it. And they were constantly using the EPA and the federal government as their boogeyman, which they can no longer do. So now, so now, Colorado, some are, you know, we may be going there voluntarily. I don't know if you've heard, but we have a, our gubernatorial candidate on the Democrat side, Jared Polis, has said, um, He's going to out California, California. We're going 100% predominantly industrial wind. There'll be a little solar. And he hasn't said any of the specifics, but we're going 100% renewable energy by 2040. So uh, welcome to Colorado, where we'll probably look closer to something like North Korea um, <laughs> when it comes to, to electricity that is actually available to us. Better mountains. Well, you, you know, you're right, you know, right. And, and, and probably um, a little nicer skiing, yes. a little better skiing, yeah. maybe a little better cuisine. Yeah. Um, but, but the point being is that now Colorado and in other states that want to do these things, we must now own them. And, and that includes um, our governor, he issued a, um, an executive order last year, about this time last year, and uh, he's going to comply with the Paris Climate Treaty, for which we're all thankful, because that's going to make a huge difference. Um, and the other one, we're now going to, we're chasing after California on cafe standards. So uh, we're, we're, we're thankful that we're going to be, he's going to be driving up the price of cars in the state of Colorado. Of course, all of this is happening long after these guys um, escape or flee the governor's mansion. And, and what is left in, the, in their wake is economic devastation, but they'll be long gone. So um, the, the point being, we get to have the hand-to-hand -hand combat. We get to fight in the trenches now because we don't have to shoot the interballistic missiles at Washington, D.C., because thanks to the brilliant plan that, uh, that the transition team led by, by Myron put together, much of this stuff has been brought back to the states exactly where it should be and exactly um, um, in the place where we can have the most impact on it. These guys will have to own it. So and it's going to be a big issue for us in, in the gubernatorial race. I know that climate change and everything isn't a huge, doesn't pull well nationally, but in Colorado it is a, it is a religion. And so, uh, and we don't just talk about it on, on, on Sundays. Um, it, it is a big deal, and, and we will be um, climate change, environmentalism, energy policy. We now have on the ballot 2,500 foot setback. So, just um, for oil and gas development, things like methane rules came out of Colorado. So, um, here's, here's what I would suggest to EPA and DC just whatever Colorado does, don't do it. <laughs> just look at that and say, no, okay, we're not doing that. Anyway, um, I, that, that's all I have, but I want to thank you guys for the Can plan and also being see. able to have the, the, the combat right in Colorado was way more fun than fighting in D.C. <laughs> thank you, Amy. Yeah. 
before we get to questions, I'd like to make a comment on something Amy, uh, or on Amy's really her main point. Uh, and this is before Joe Bass asks his endangerment question. <laughs> uh, uh, the Obama era was about turning the United States into California. It wasn't about you're all going to get good scenery and nice beaches, but you're all going to have to follow this model of high energy prices, and we're going to we're going to decarbonize the economy by sending all of the heavy carbon producing stuff to other countries and we'll import it. California, mm -hmm. Californians buy a couple million cars a year in a good year, but they don't, they used to produce quite a few in California, at least assemble them there, well over a million, but now they only produce mm -hmm. Teslas, right? And, and so the whole model was everybody is going to have to become like California. Well, is that possible? Don't, don't there have to still be some people who dig up stuff and make stuff? Uh, instead of just sit at a, com I, you know, we all sit at computer screens all day and manipulate information, <laughs> but not everybody can do that because we still need stuff. Well, Calif the California model, Obama, Obama had Barbara Boxer, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and George Miller all repeating over and over again, California is the future. Well, the Trump election victory called a halt to that disastrous course, and now states get to pick which model they want. Well, now, but some states can be. And everybody knows where we're going. Yeah, no, <laughs> in Colorado, no, but, don't do what we do. But but we're now. But I raise this because we're now going to have a very divergent. There, there's two models now. California, New York, and New England, and some of the other eastern states have got one model, which is service sector, and we import everything that we eat, drink, use, and, and we'll provide the services that you need, financial, entertainment, the, the, you know, the cell phones, we'll design those, and all the other states will produce stuff. So I, this, is, this is somewhat, this is heartening that not everybody has to become like California, but it's also, I think, worrying that we're going to have two very different models of... of and I'm going to add something to that. Sorry, Steve. Sorry. Um, um, Colorado is now having... We are in an identity crisis. Mm -hmm. the, the conversation daily, if you, if you read newspapers, letters, letters to the editor, social media, media is, will we become California? It, it, it is... Um, that your, your boss creates most of that. Um, yeah, except for what I love it is, is now the Republican Governors Association is is using it in ads. Oh. So so so, but there but there is a very real there is a very real uh, identity crisis going on right now in the state. Or where are we going? Because you're absolutely right. This is about driving out the people who make stuff or the extraction industry. Um, a a 2,500 set foot or setback, you think about it, almost 5,000 feet in circumference, darn near a mile. It will shut down the oil and gas industry. 85% of it will be shut down. I, I mean, I live in Weld County. We have home of 25,000 oil and gas wells, predominantly oil, uh, and, and those are hydraulically fractured, and a 5,000 foot setback would, or well, 5,000 circumference. It would literally cripple, it would cripple the economy, not just of Weld County, but the entire state. But if you want to look like California, what do you do? You, you get rid of those kinds of industries. We already drove out gun manufacturers. And one, one first question, and it's a little facetious, but uh, why does Tom Steyer hate poor people? <laughs> yeah. I, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, I'd love for him to sit in Sharon Garcia's living room and explain to her why she's better off uh, pondering how she's going to put food on the table. And I mentioned Tom Steyer, and it's, uh, he's leading multiple efforts at the state level. In, in Arizona, particularly. In, in Arizona. He's looking at Nevada. Uh, I presume he'll be in and Colorado. In Michi he's in Michigan. He too, won right? in, well, he already won in Michigan. Oh, he won in Michigan. And one thing that uh, Amy didn't mention, I didn't hear any of these uh, in these conferences mentioned, but utility executives. Uh, they have freedom and latitude to do a number of these things. 
Uh, but tell me, what's the expectation? Will they uh, act as if Hillary Clinton won, or whether the, we, there's a, a new president of the United States? And uh, what I think we're seeing in Colorado is they're proceeding ahead with as if the Clean Power Plan is still in effect. Is, is that the case? Is that what you're seeing? Absolutely. Um, so in um, 2016, our largest, uh, they call it investor-owned, I call them monopoly utilities, our largest investor-owned utility monopoly, Xcel Energy, issued their ERP. It was in May, um, they, well, they filed it, May of 2016. Whole thing was predicated on Hillary Clinton winning. And what you saw in the, in the comments at the time, it was, well, and, and the clean power, lawsuits against the clean power plan were already moving ahead. And at that time, to remember that we had had the stay against the clean power plan. So there was that historic stay, uh, and it wasn't, it, so they couldn't, utilities at least were, were wondering, were second guessing whether or not they should rush to comply. So the X, XL issues its ERP, and it was, the whole thing was, well, we may lose in court, but we foresee uh, having to sort of decarbonize, and we see this transition to fossil or away from fossil fuels towards renewables as, as the wave of the future, and we're going to continue to go that direction because they believed Hillary Clinton was going to win. If you read between the lines, the whole thing was based on Hillary Clinton winning. So when Hillary Clinton lost, I think it was you know within a couple of weeks, I wrote, uh, "Excel needs to issue a whole new ERP." Well, they didn't. They didn't want to. They already had money invested. So they go to the state legislature. The state legislature shoots down their ERP to transition away from, like I said, affordable hydrocarbons towards predominantly industrial wind. And they're going from, they're looking at 55% renewables by, rough, by roughly by 2030. I mean, this is a massive transformation in a state that's growing. Um, so they try to get it through the state legislature twice, they fail twice. So they go to the governor who then signs an executive order, they use that as their authority to voluntarily shut down uh, what are arguably the most cost-effective and two of the most environmentally superior coal fire plants certainly in the state of Colorado, possibly in the nation. So they're shutting down close to 700 megawatts of coal, and they're going to replace it with 20 to 2,400 megawatts of all kinds of other stuff. Well, and they're going to save ratepayers money. Well, do the math. I mean, none of that works. None of it works. So, so we've been intervening on that, and thanks to the Heartland Institute and James, um, James Taylor for coming out, we've been intervening at the, in the regulatory space uh, in that proceeding, but we couldn't have done that had it not been for a Trump administration EPA. There would have been no point because we would have just lost. But because of, the, of this new EPA, we are able to have that fight at the state level. All right, let's go to audience uh, questions. Jim has a microphone. Okay. Uh, Jason Hayes from the Mackinac Center in Michigan, and I actually wrote about uh, that, um, what's going on in Michigan with Tom Steyer. I published that in the Wall Street Journal. So Thank you. He's, uh, he's helping. But I wanted to go to what uh, Amy was talking about and uh, what's happening with Ms. Garcia and that. And I've got a quote that we received from a past MPSC, a Public Service Commission member from Michigan. And his quote was, there's no question that we've enjoyed a long decade, a century almost, of unlimited power and being able to use it in any fashion, way and shape you wanted to. And that is going to change. <laughs> I would hope that what we're going to do is better educate and provide the kind of incentives so that people are aware of their electric use and the options available to more efficiently utilize it. So Ms. Garcia, she's, she, 
she could move to Michigan yeah, and have but, the but, exact same experience. But, but, but Jason, experience teaches all these people to become less and less candid yes, about their yeah. aims. Yeah, and I'm not fact, sure that that was some, a mistake, some years but, Some years ago in, in London, one of the, uh, uh, somebody in the government actually said, well, people are going to have to get used to using electricity when it's available. <laughs> yeah, and Michigan well, you can is imagine going how, that way. You, you can imagine how popular that was. <laughs> and they, so they stopped talking about it, but they kept pursuing the same policies. Yeah, and just to give you an example, what Michigan's big plan, Consumers Energy is one of our monopoly utilities. They just released their IRP. Their plan to power the portion of Michigan in which they operate is to close all their coal plants, to cease their power purchase agreement for the one nuclear plant that they have, so that one's gonna close. They're gonna close most of their natural gas, leave 1.4 gigs of natural gas. They're gonna finish building half a gig of wind and build in Michigan, they're gonna build 6.35 gigs of solar. This is how we're gonna power our It'll state. Work. The oh, rest, that's brilliant. The rest yeah. is going brilliant. to the hour a day. <laughs> so, so this is, this is, Comments. talk about being candid. Um, for those who know how monopoly utilities operate, they, fuel is usually just a pass through cost, right? You, you just recover the cost and that's it. But if you build up your asset base, that's where they get an authorized rate of return. So if they've got $5 billion worth of assets um, and, they, and they bump that up to $10 billion, well, guess which one is better at a, roughly a 10% rate of return? You can imagine where they're headed. Well, on the latest uh, XL Energy earnings call, the, the president, Ben Fokey, said to this group of, of investors, he said their strategy is fuel for steel. So in other words, fuel's just a pass-through cost, but steel, on the other hand, you build it, you build up your asset base, and you get that 10% authorized rate of return on it. So they like the tariffs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fuel yeah. for steel. So they want to get rid of the pass-through cost in favor of padding the asset base. Yeah, and as we go to the next question, a note, uh, and thank you on the Michigan experience, I mean, Mr. Steyer's folks met with the two largest utilities, and uh, he had threatened to put on an initiative on the ballot, and the utility says, no need, Mr. Steyer, we will do what we'll you say. And think about that when we're trying to reform that uh, these kind of individuals from out of state can tell you what happens in Michigan. Next question. Uh, Jerry Henson from Chattanooga. Do you folks expect a more conservative Supreme Court to either attack or help attack the administrative state? Well, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, I hope so. I hope it's going to be 5-4 until Ruth Bader Ginsburg gets off. Or, well, yeah, look, but, but, you know, I, I'll say that um, you know, now John Roberts is going to be the new Anthony Kennedy, so I really don't know how he's going to come out on things. Yeah. I mean, he should, he should go the right way, because I know a little bit about his history, but, you know, some of his past decisions, I, I, I just don't know. We're just going to have to see how this shakes out. Yeah, but look, uh, one of the conservative defenders of this great victory by our side called Chevron deference, remember Chevron, NRDC lost that case, and they've been, they've been, you know, taking the, the benefits from losing that case ever since. Chevron deference was supported by Scalia. Mm -hmm. The biggest opponent of Chevron deference in the country is Neil Gorsuch. And Brett Kavanaugh is also one of the leading critics of Chevron deference. So if we could get rid of Chevron deference or limit it, then this would be a huge uh, step forward uh, from our great victory back in the when, when, in the 80s when they when NRDC <laughs> lost Chevron against Chevron. Uh, uh, secondly, I, I want to point out one thing that you know we've talked about this uh, during the day, but one of the huge problems with the Trump administration is their lackadaisical attitude towards nominating people for key positions, mm -hmm. and then once they do nominate them, the Senate doesn't confirm them. 
uh, in a timely way because of Democrat obstruction and Republican uh, utter incompetence. <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the people that's absolutely key is the Assistant Attorney General for the Energy and Natural Resources Division. He's the guy who defends all of, these, all of this deregulation in all of the appeals that will be filed by the environmental groups. The Trump administration actually did a good job, the White House did a good job of getting a really great person nominated in a timely way, and the Senate Judiciary Committee voted him out in July, July of last year. His name is Jeff Clark. He still awaits a vote on the Senate floor. And if you start, if, if the administration starts losing cases on appeal by the environmental groups, it's because the Democrats have, and, and Mitch McConnell have failed, uh, Mitch McConnell has failed and the Democrats have succeeded in blocking his confirmation now for over a year. And by the way, he's one of us. Uh, he is absolutely solid. I, I, I hate to say that about a lawyer, but he's, he's solid. And uh, we, we need Jeff Clark in that job. So if it, Corey Gardner, by the way, was, uh, had a hold on him for uh, several months uh, because he thought it was more important to defend Colorado's marijuana laws than de to defend uh, the uh, environmental uh, deregulation that was benefiting his voters in rural Colorado. You want me to text him? <laughs> hey, next question, Linnea. Uh, Hi, my name's Bob Enlick. Uh, from Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm a meteorologist, and this is mostly for Myron and Steve. In 2009, when the new Obama administration came in, uh, there was a fellow named Alan Carlin who wrote a great report that said essentially more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is not a problem. And yet the political appointees in that uh, administration filed and got through an endangerment finding. Clearly there is no endangerment from additional carbon dioxide in the air, and yet this hobbles us. Can you comment? Well, I mean, it's, you know, regardless of our views, uh, there's enough people on the other side to make it a contentious issue. And since, you know, they had all the political power, they could do what they wanted. Now, we, now we have the political power, but not necessarily the interest in doing that. I know the administration has a different strategy for handling the climate issue, and at this point in time, it does not involve challenging the endangerment fund. Now, I think the, I think we all agree the endangerment fund should be challenged, but that's not what the administration plan is. And, you know, is that right or wrong? Um, you know, EPA has been allowed to run wild for 48 years. There are a million things to do and we want to do everything now. And there's, you know, there's only a handful of Trump appointees at the agency. You got 14,000 uh, Obama holdovers. I mean, there are probably a few okay people in there, but they're basically people that believe in the Obama EPA mission, and they're working against the handful. I mean, it's just, it's an impossible situation, right? And there's so much to do, hardly anybody to do it, and. Uh, you know, we we just got to try to maintain. You know, in the, in the larger picture, we just got to try to maintain, maintain control of government so that we can fix EPA over time because that's what it's going to take. Yeah. Well, uh, CEI was one of the groups uh, that petitioned EPA early on in the Trump administration to reopen and reconsider the endangerment finding, and I believe the Heartland Institute also petitioned the EPA. No. Not yet? Well, God, what are you people doing? I mean, Joe, Joe has been talking, he kept whispering to me throughout lunch, like, that's endangerment, ask her about it. Look. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, the, the, uh, there was a, the endangerment finding needs to be reopened. But what happened early on in Scott Pruitt's tenure is he got advice from his fellow lawyers, particularly in the Federalist Society, and I don't think there's unanimity in the Federalist Society on this issue, but the ones he talked to said, it's too much work and you don't need to do it because you can still repeal the rules and replace them with things that won't hurt the economy and won't bother us too much. Now, 
We're going to find out if that strategy works because the repeal and replace strategy is going to be challenged in court and we'll see how the courts rule. If, if, that, if, that, if that tactical decision was correct and the courts say, yeah, fine, and, and by the way, we, first of all, the, the, re, the replacement rules have to be okay. They can't be, you know, really terrible, right? They have to be tiny little rules that you need a microscope to right. find. If that works, then we're wrong, right? Our petition was, was not the right course. If it fails, if it starts to fail, as I believe it might, and I'm not a lawyer, thank God, um, but if, if it starts to fail, then I think the administration is going to need to revisit that, what I believe was an initially wrong decision, and say we're going to reconsider the endangerment finding because that's the only way to ever stamp this stuff out. Uh, and so we'll see. But of course, we're now counting on a second Trump term because this, this can't possibly be finished now right. in a first Trump term. How long will Lotus, Lotus take to finish? It would seem like a simple matter for a former member of Congress. Couldn't they fix that? Uh, that's still 20 months away or so before they could actually finalize that rule? Where are we at? The Waters of the U.S. rule uh, is absolutely essential to... Uh, look, the wetlands uh, program under the Clean Water Act was totally out of control before WOTUS, right? The jurisdiction is way too big. It, it's stopping far too much. It's stopping hundreds of billions of dollars of private investment on private land for private projects that would pay taxes and employ people. It was out of control before the waters of the U.S. rule. So what they, need, what they need to do is to repeal WOTUS and then they need to replace it with a definition of jurisdictional wetlands that will shrink the federal footprint on private land in America. So the first thing that they did was they, there, there weren't enough political people in place who knew what they were doing. So the initial uh, proposed repeal rule was defective. It's my view it was defective intentionally by, I believe, that career staff sabotage the repeal rule. So they then had to add a supplemental this summer to it, many, many, many months later, to fix the initial defects. So we're now looking at stretching this out. And then the next question is, once they've repealed WOTUS, will they replace it with a rule that shrinks federal jurisdictional claims over wetlands? This is, this is huge for rural Americans. I mean, it's as big, almost as big as the Endangered Species Act, which, which Interior has put out now, finally, some proposals to reform the regulations under the Endangered Species Act, which were initially talked about in early in the George W. Bush administration, but never proposed because of environmentalist opposition within the George W. Bush administration. <clears throat> Next question. Got three more questions, they tell me. Okay. Hi, Dave Stevenson from the Caesar Rodney Institute in Delaware. Uh, we've had a lot of successes on the on the EPA transition team's uh, strategy plan. Two others that have not made much progress are the RFS and refrigerants. Would you care to comment on those? And just for information, uh, two national members of the Sierra Club visited with our public advocate in Delaware. And when asked, they said they do not support utility-scale solar. Oh, let, 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 me start, let me start by saying, I think many of you know Dave Stevenson, but he was a very valuable member, another state-based member, a st state policy uh, group member of the transition team, and he made great contributions. Um, look, Trump ran in favor of the ethanol mandate. So how are we going to make progress on it? <laughs> the one thing about Trump that everybody needs to understand is he didn't have a policy apparatus during the campaign. He didn't have a bunch of white papers by experts that fudged all the issues. He just gave speeches in which he made promises. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but every time he makes a major announcement, he says, I'm not like those other presidents that we've had recently. I'm the guy who keeps his promises. I keep those promises. He's kept virtually all of the promises that haven't required congressional action. Like he hasn't built the wall because that requires appropriation, for example. 
So he, he ran in favor of the ethanol mandate. What are you going to do? It was a promise. Refrigerants, that's, that's so technical, Dave. Let's go to, <laughs> let's, 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 let's go. Thank you, Myron. Let's, let's, go, let's go to CAFE. There was a panel, uh, I, I did, couldn't go to it because I was talking on the competing panel and I hope all of you went to the CAFE panel. Uh, uh, I know some of you didn't, but I won't hold that against you. The, this, what they have done, not EPA, but primarily the Department of Transportation, what they have done to reform the Obama CAFE uh, standards and to kick California out of the decision-making process is stunning. And I have uh, four handouts in the back which you can pick up. One of them is an op-ed I published uh, last week on what they've done with the CAFE standards and why it's important. Another is the uh, Cooler Heads Digest which has an article by my colleague Marla Lewis which is headlined something like uh, why everything that they've done on CAFE is a, is a free marketer's dream, you know. I mean, they, they did everything right. I mean, it's just, it's stunning what, what DOT and EPA together, it's mostly DOT, but it's stunning what they have done and the effect that this will have on Americans' freedom to choose what kind of car they want to buy and how much it costs. So, so I, I, I bring that up, Dave, because uh, car air conditioners are part of that puzzle. <laughs> uh, Two and, questions. And, what, and just on, on CAFE, when you think yes, about CAFE, you know, between the Clean Power Plan and CAFE, uh, virtually the entire Obama climate legacy has just been you know, Poof. eviscerated. It's gone. So. Yeah, it's gone. Uh, Bill Lindquist, Northern California. Uh, this is directed at uh, Amy. Um, I lived in Colorado for 20 years a long time ago. And I think your governor is a fellow geologist, is he not? Well, he, yeah, he, uh, well, he let is. Me, let a, me continue. He's, he's a, a geologist who got laid off and, yeah, then, be, okay. and then started uh, making craft beer, became mayor of Denver, and then from there you become governor. Anyway, my it's question pretty easy is. Step. <laughs> Are your politicians and bureaucrats in Colorado and elsewhere taking note of the experiences of other parts of the world who have, and I, I note specifically the state of South Australia and Australia, which has gone hog wild into renewables, especially wind. They've not only closed down a bunch of their base load power plants, but destroyed them. And about two years ago, they had a statewide blackout which was devastating to the whole state and particularly industry. As band-aids, they're put on a bunch of diesel generators and can you believe it, they bought a 100 megawatt lithium battery off Tesla that will keep the state going, I believe, for about four minutes. <laughs> Is Colorado heading down the same path? You know, so you bring up a great point and um, about... <laughs> Four full minutes, huh? <laughs> um, imagine what'll happen when it goes out during a Bronco game. Um, that, that'll that cause rioting in the streets. You know, I, I keep wondering what the tipping point is. I don't know what it is. Listen, I thought a 62% rise in electricity rates would do it. Um, but you still have people saying, yeah, I'll pay a few more, few more bucks. Um, one of the things that we know, because we've seen polling on it, is that in Colorado in particular, they just love wind and solar, and they think it's free, because everyone's it's told them it's told free. Them. Um, they, they just don't tell them that to ter convert it into electricity is really expensive. <clears throat> Nobody's seen a giant utility scale battery but they're told it, it's like a it unicorn. Exists. You think no one's actually seen it, but you think it's really cool. So nobody's actually seen what this looks like, but they think it sounds really, really cool. And I hate to say this about my own state, and I'm, you know, I've got one of my representatives right here. I almost think it's going to take one of those blackouts or rolling some kind of before people say enough. I, I, I think we might have to get to that point. I hope not, but I think we might because 
There's an overwhelm. People just love wind and solar. They love it. They love it. They love it. I, th I think you're being overly optimistic. In New England, <laughs> in New England you know, they they uh, um, they run. They need more gas pipelines. Well, didn't they, they have to? Stay warm. Wait, didn't I mean, they have to be, import gonna, gonna Russian have like Russian natural gas? Yeah, no, it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> and you I, know, I, I think the basic problem is that. Politicians mostly hear just from the other side. They don't really hear from us all that much. I mean, energy and EPA became yeah. a big issue in 2016 because that's what Trump was talking about, right? right. Hillary wasn't talking about it that much. So, and I don't know if you've ever gone to one of these these town halls where, and I'm sure you have. I'm not gonna, but but. Uh, I, this, I've heard that real people go to those town halls. Right. Is that right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> they're all like I I, I call them. Yeah, you know, they're all party. Patagonia <laughs> wearing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're and, and they're in there just saying they're talking about about childhood asthma, which is a very real thing. I get it, but you would think that there are literally kids dead on the street, and well, and nobody once asks sort of where are all these children? Like, I mean, I live in Weld yeah. County, as I said, we have a lot of oil and gas wells. It, but by by the environmental lefts, by by all of their their perspective. The kids in Weld County should have their growth stunted, um, and, and in fact, they probably shouldn't even be kids in Weld County. Yet we have one of the healthiest counties in the state. I mean, so to answer, I just don't know unless there is literally a, a time where there, the electricity isn't there. Because if you talk, there, there's a, a, a friend who is an engineer who um, has said. He said repeatedly, he said, when the time comes at 2 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon and there is no electricity and we can't get it anymore, that's when you're, and people are demanding it and it's your child on an operating room table, then suddenly people are going to, they're not going to care if it came from wind or solar or natural yeah, gas or unicorns. It yeah, won't but, but, matter. Yeah, but, but, but Amy, Amy but you, are, you, you are too optimistic because every time this has happened, the environmentalists have had some completely bogus reason right. for why it happened. In South Australia, it was we're, we're exporting too much natural gas, right? <laughs> That's, that was, they tried to sell that for, I mean, and that, this is what happens. It can, with the, the power going out in New England can't possibly be because they've blocked every natural right. gas pipeline. Well, There's got to be some other. Shut down the nuclear plant. Yeah, have, shut down, yeah. yeah. We have one out. last question, but an observation about, uh, don't forget uh, the uh, carbon tax failed on the Washington state ballot, which is a pretty far Yay. left. They brought it back again. So there are- uh, and, the, and the gas tax in California. There, there are a number of things. And I do know for a fact that 953 emails were generated to public utility commissioners over this issue in Colorado, just Thank with you, a Harvard. very small investment. And the left, I don't think is generating a lot of emails on this topic. So I think when you describe the cost and the impact on folks like Miss Garcia, I, I think I think we, we have a chance. Yeah. And uh, today, there are literally tens and thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars of ads being run in Arizona uh, against Tom Steyer and against his initiative there. And well, hopefully that'll be successful as well. So let me see. I got time for I guess one last question. Very quick. Very quick question. There's Sterling in the back. Okay. This, oh. uh, yeah. I, I, so uh, Peter Farrar, Heartland Institute. In my opinion, there's going to be a political backlash against the California model in California this year. And uh, the question I want to ask you on, uh, on the basis of that, and remember that when the blackout started in California, what did the people of California do? They recalled the incumbent Democrat governor and replaced him with a Republican. And this year, they also already recalled an incumbent Democrat senator and reestablished the ability of the Republicans to block uh, uh, to block tax increases in the Senate. But uh, in light of that, how do you, what are your thoughts about how, how do you uh, handicap the governor's race in Colorado this year? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, um, I'm the worst political prognosticator <laughs> on planet Earth. But I'm going to say that I think actually, I, I, I'm one of those who actually thinks our gubernatorial candidate, Walker Stapleton, has a chance because uh, Jared Polis is, is, is really, really extreme even for Colorado. He is a bolder, progressive left 
Um, and so there's a path for Walker Stapleton to win. I know that probably flies in the face of national conventional wisdom, but there, I, I, I'm not as down on, on Walker Stapleton as, as a lot of the national pundits are. I think he has a chance. I shouldn't say they're down on him. I just think that they're like, oh yeah, Polis is gonna win. Here's the deal though, Polis, Polis can self-fund if, if, if um, Walker Stapleton raises $10 million, Polis can put in $11 million. He can self-fund the whole thing. He's been laying the groundwork for this for a long time. Still, still, I just think he might be a progressive left bridge too far, even for Colorado. That being said, I hope he wins so that he can like make me a PUC commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for uh, the uh, conferees and joining us on, on this panel. Uh, we're going to wrap this up, and at 6.30, the doors open for our dinner just down the hall. We will see you there shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.